Howdy y'all, this is Wes and welcome to my customary end of year list. As 2022 draws to a close, it's time to look back at yet another great year of gaming. It's time to celebrate our favorite titles, new and old, that we fell in love with these past 12 months. Or maybe we continue to praise the old standbys that we kept coming back to. For me, there were a few titles that I knew I would love right off the bat, but there were also some pretty big surprises along the way. Now, this list will be a bit different from some others you might watch, as it does not just include new releases. Any game of any age may be counted, as long as I played it for the first time this year. While I did take release date into account, I couldn't dismiss a couple of classics that I experienced for the first time, or those that finally got a PC port this year. However, I did limit it to one game per franchise, otherwise half of this list would come from my complete playthrough of the Final Fantasy series. So here we go. My top 10 games I played this year. After Endwalker crushed the competition for my list last year, would anything in 2022 come close? Did I even get to play 10 games this year? Time to find out. Starting off at number 10 is Potionomics from Voracious Games. This year saw a rise in a relatively new genre. Chill potion crafting simulators that let you hang back, brew some bottles, and slowly haggle your way into success. And then there's Potionomics. Here, you play a young potion maker who inherits her uncle's shop, along with his debt. The game is hard, very hard, with a limited amount of time to bring your skill up before you are thrust into the competitive world of small town businesses. You must manage your time wisely to brew potions, collect materials, and negotiate with customers, or you will fail. The game is very different from what I expected in the previews. However, the fantastic art style, engaging characters, and the wild card deck system kept me entertained despite having to start over a few times right out of the gate. Potionomics is not for the faint of heart, but once I embraced the madness of it all, I found it to be one of the most charming games of the year. Number 9, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles Shredder's Revenge from Tribute Games. Shredder's Revenge is a game with one singular statement, that the four-player unit in every arcade in the country was the peak of gaming and we need more of it. After playing it, they might have been right. Expanding to up to six players, this is a modern game that manages to absolutely nail the retro feel of the original while providing plenty that's new. Everything from the graphics to the soundtrack to the movesets, they all feel completely familiar without becoming a shallow cash-in. The game has love pouring out of the screen, and players both young and old can enjoy a classic street brawler with a current day touch. It is a bit short, though the arcade mode gives plenty of replay value, and the online play is sadly non-existent these days. Still, if you have friends to play with or just want a great beat-em-up experience for yourself, Shredder's Revenge is very much worth your time. Number 8, Gundam Evolution by Bandai Namco. Gundam Evo is the perfect example of a great game scuttled early by the corporation running it. With its obscene battle pass and unit unlock systems, it joins Overwatch 2 as one of the greediest games on the market right now. So how did it end up on the list? Because ultimately, the game is fun. Turning iconic Gundams into a hero shooter worked extremely well, taking concepts of the genre and iterating on them to remove the drawbacks. There are no roles you're forced into, every unit has movement boosts, and it features a little guy in a big city. And the balance needs work overall, and obviously the monetization is horrendous, but G-Evo has tons of potential as a competitive arena shooter if a few changes can be made. It's still fairly new, and while NA servers are on life support, the game still has a robust following on Japan servers to scratch that itch. If Bandai can listen to feedback, this could be a great alternative for players looking for hero shooters. Even if the game doesn't survive, I still had a blast while it was around. Number 7, A Plague Tale Requiem by Asobo Studio. 
I had not heard of, let alone played, the first Plague Tale when I saw the newest chapter drop on Game Pass. What I hoped would be a nice filler game turned out to be a beautiful and engrossing story of family, loss, and survival. Even though I missed the first chapter, Requiem does a good job of filling new players in on the fight against the Dark Plague following Amicia to new lands. It's not a perfect game, with many of the combat elements feeling clunky and pared down compared to the games like Horizon that it borrows from. Yet it's gorgeously rendered, and the engaging story manages to pull a lot away from the game's faults. Even when I was frustrated with a failed attempt at stealth, I wanted to continue going to save Hugo from the terrors lurking in the dark. For a game that I had no expectations for, it will go down as my favorite rap-based game for the foreseeable future. I rate it Bay out of 10. Number 6. Final Fantasy V Pixel Remaster by Square Enix I could easily fill this list with Final Fantasies, but in my playthrough so far, Final Fantasy V has been the standout. Having bowed out of the 4-job fiesta early for several years now, I was finally able to experience this legendary title in its entirety. It's the point where Squaresoft had solidified its status as the premier maker of JRPGs of the time, and where the franchise canon truly came into focus. While it might not match up to the heights of some of the later titles, it was clear why the game is so beloved among fans of the series. With iconic tracks, wonderful characters, and plenty of memorable sequences, 5 is a testament to the power of the brand and a great showcase for why the name has persisted for over 30 years. With the remaster, Square was able to build upon the original SNES foundation to create what might be the most fully realized version of the game. Graphics, music, and balance all wonderfully done for both new and old players alike. I can't believe it took me this long to play it, but I will definitely be back for next year's Fiesta. With these remastered versions, there's no better time to become a Final Fantasy fan. Kicking off my top 5 is Xenoblade Chronicles 3 by Monolith Soft. I don't turn my actual television on very often, but when I do, it's usually for a Xenoblade game. If any franchise has justified the purchase of a console for me, it's this one. The third entry into the series is no exception, building upon what worked in Xenoblade 2 while removing the gacha mechanics and other criticized gameplay. It still has all the traditions of a great Xenoblade title, beautiful semi-open worlds, a robust combat system, and the joys of accidentally running into mobs 60 levels above your own. It also manages to do so without being derivative like so many half-baked JRPG sequels these days. It is very much its own story, jumping straight into the coming-of-age tale of Noah and his companions. Yet the darker aspects of the story, and they can be dark, are balanced by plenty of bright moments as well. The villains aren't just a nameless cabal lurking in the shadows, they have a distinct personality and in many cases are just plain fun. Characters embrace anime tropes while exploring why they can be so entertaining in the first place. And most importantly, it features plenty more Welsh cat girls. All of this together makes another wonderful entry into the Xenoblade franchise, a step up from the last title that is sure to please both veterans and newcomers. Number 4, Stray by Blue 12 Studio. From the moment it was announced, Stray took the gaming world by storm. Blue 12 could have rested easily on the concept, making a simple game in which you just play as a cat and called it a day. And, well, that's exactly what they did. Yet Stray is so much more than that. It's a brilliant tale about the future, what it means to be human, how we connect with others, and why we dare to dream. For a game with no combat and only a few simplistic puzzles, Stray encompasses so much about what can be great about using video games to tell a story. But it's not just the story either. The game itself was clearly made with plenty of passion, from the environments to the sheer amount of detail that went into being, well, a cat. They took a gamble on something different for the gaming sphere and knocked it out of the park, showing that well-made experimental concepts can still become wildly successful. In keeping it small, Stray has shown the biggest heart of the year. However, as we enter the top three, it still couldn't overcome the next game, 
which features a character who is definitely not a cat. Number 3, Persona 5 Royal by Atlas. I haven't owned a PlayStation in years, so I missed the Persona games during their initial releases. When I saw P5R was a day one Game Pass release for its PC port, I don't think I have ever slammed the install button so quickly. For the next two weeks, Persona was my life. It might have even been more than that because nothing can prepare you for a story-based game with a runtime of over 100 hours. It is a journey. An epic that by the end of it felt like I just binged several seasons of one of the best animes ever made. Everything in this game is so polished, so stylishly created that any heist I watch in the future might very well be judged against the Phantom Thieves. This is one of those cases where missing the initial rush probably helped. Knowing very little about the game other than bits of cultural osmosis allowed me to truly experience the game fresh and it will now join the ranks of games I wish I could erase from memory just so I could do it again. After all of the hype, Persona 5 Royal lived up to its status as one of the best JRPGs of all time. It took my heart and ran away with it in a flurry of jazz. Still, despite all of the hours I put into Persona, it could not topple number two on my list. If we're talking about the sheer value between hours played and the cost, this one-person show reigned over everything this year. Number 2. Vampire Survivors by Ponkle Vampire Survivors is the story about a dream. The dream of one person staring at a screen and saying, I should make a video game. What started as a fun way to build a community has become a lightning rod for the power of independent developers. When Luca first published it, I don't think they expected their little project to become the sensation it has, inspiring countless spin-offs and drawing in players like its own horde of monsters. But all of that praise is well deserved because they created one of the most enjoyable games in years. They return to a simple formula that games don't have to be grand or cutting edge to be fun or replayable. It's so easy to spend dozens upon dozens of hours in this game trying new characters, new weapons, new levels, all without spending more than the price of a coffee. It's the kind of game I would have loved as a kid, and thanks to Vampire Survivors I can love it as an adult. It's a testament to that community they tried to build that almost all of this came via word of mouth people in discords, forums, and watching VTubers. Vampire Survivors is guerrilla game development at its finest, and the industry is better off for it. It was a tough decision between Vampire Survivors and my number one game, but when I looked at the hours I've spent and how consumed I became at release, there was only one choice. A choice I knew nothing about and had no intention of playing, but I knew in my heart would be my number one the moment I stepped into its world. Number 1. Elden Ring by From Software. Nothing could have prepared me for Elden Ring. I'm not the biggest Souls fan and I kept up with almost none of the press leading up to its release. In fact, I only bought it because of internet peer pressure and I'm very, very glad that I did. Elden Ring is everything a true high fantasy game should be. The first Souls title that genuinely felt like an Arthurian legend of old to me. No microtransactions, no in-game shop or service marketing, just pure, realized gaming. While it may have some faults, especially in the later third, they are overshadowed by the weight of everything else before it. By opening up the world, it allowed me to push aside the narrow hallways and repetition that put me off of the older games in favor of the exploration and immersion that I love. It still has those dungeons, of course, but that's the great thing about the game. You can approach it however you want. Naked level 1 runs are over leveled to smash through the frustration. Follow the story or make your own. All within a momentous, gorgeous, terrifying Souls world unlike anything that has come before it. I found myself putting in hours talking about the game with others, trying to delve into secrets that had not yet been discovered. 
After beating a boss, I would run it again and again as a summon, helping others through their own adventures, appreciating the many different builds and playstyles available. And sometimes, I would just roam around, taking screenshots and feeling at peace in a land that wanted anything but. Even after all this time, there are still catacombs and bosses I have not touched, lurking below for my next playthrough. There is a reason Elden Ring is going to be on list after list this year, and while it may not be all that creative of a choice, it's one I stand by. Elden Ring is truly remarkable in its scale and depth, the culmination of everything that FromSoft has learned up until now. If this is the benchmark going forward, I can't wait to see what comes next. It's not just my game of the year, but a landmark for the current era of gaming. And once again, another year has come and gone. Thank you so much for watching. Feel free to comment with your favorite games of the year, and together, let's celebrate those titles we loved in 2022. For more live streams and gaming content, as always, like, subscribe, all that bell stuff, you know the deal. I'm Wessor, and I'll see you in 2023.